Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today we have a fascinating guest from the UK, Ian Tolhurst, and he's known in the UK as Tully, is been at the forefront of the UK organic farming movement for over 40 years. His eight hectare farm has won many awards, the most recent being Soil Farmer of the Year. His most recent book, Back to the Land is a chronological compilation of many of the articles and papers that he has written during his long career, giving a fascinating account of the way his farm and business has developed with much emphasis on soil management. The farm is a model of sustainability and produces a wide range of produce for the local community. Visitors from all over the world are able to see for themselves the various components of the stock-free organic farm, from the green manures and diverse rotations to the wood chip compost and integration of agroforestry into the vegetable system. Ian has been able to maintain a viable and sustainable business on land, which is not considered suitable for vegetable production. The integration of crops and biodiversity makes for a fascinating and durable agricultural system. He's been heard to say the primary product of this farm is a culture of biodiversity. Food production is the byproduct of that. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me, Michael. So give me a little bit of an overview of your operation. Obviously you grow vegetables, but give us kind of like, uh, you know, how did the farm get started and kind of like, where are you today with that? Right. Okay. Well, we're quite an intensive farm. We grow a whole range of vegetables. In fact, we grow more than a hundred different types of vegetables. Um, We have three separate rotations. We have a field scale rotation. We have a polytunnel rotation and we have a garden crops rotation. We also grow fruit. Um, We used to be very big on strawberries many years ago, but we've cut back somewhat because of difficulties of labor, but we still do a, a couple of tons every year. We produce around 140 tonnes of vegetables and fruit on our eight hectares, which is about 17 acres, I think, in your money. Uh It's a very diverse business. Um, We've been established. In fact, my farming career goes back to 1976. I actually started in in a year, which was our longest ever drought. We had a six-month drought that year, so I, I remember it very well. But I had been on a dairy farm for three years previous to that, Um conventional farm which kind of opened my eyes to the the horrors of modern farming systems and I always wanted to do something a lot more organic well of course in those days there wasn't a lot of examples around however to try and cut a long story short we ended up with a piece of land in Cornwall which was really not very good at all Um, I did 10 years there it's sort of my apprenticeship if you like um, Uh making lots and lots of mistakes because in those days there wasn't really many people to talk to about this Uh and then I moved to a a more favorable site in the south of England we started off in Cornwall which is in the far west so then we moved to uh, Oxfordshire Uh, we're very close to River Thames and we're only 20 miles from Oxford it's uh, it's a much better climate you know we have better sunshine we have better rainfall um, well we have less rainfall which for us is actually not such a problem and we developed the business here so it's been an organic growth really for one of a better word it's taken a long time to build the business up we started from scratch We've, we've always been until recently we've always been short of capital um the farm we're on we do not own this land in fact i don't own any property at all in this country we are tenant farmers we have a a very long tenancy arrangement um and we operate the business as a community interest company we've got at the moment we have five you know six full-time employees we've just we've actually taken on another 1.5 1.5 people this year the um the covid crisis has actually been very favorable to us and we've, we've we've increased our sales and our production quite dramatically in the last few months fascinating so talk to me about the i think you said it called it a community interest company yes this is um, a relatively new form of company structure it is limited by guarantee so it's like a limited company the difference is we have to tick certain boxes. And one of them is that we have to be operating in such a way that we are working for the community. This is not a business managed by the community, but we are working for the community. The community in our case is, or are, 
our vegetable customers and also advisory clients. But I have quite a lot of business to do with advising other farms and we do seminars and workshops. So they are part of our community as well. The business um, is structured in such a way that <clears throat> we have a board of directors, myself, um, two family members and another person. Um, we don't own shares. There are no shares in the business. We are, Our liability is based on, on, on a one pound deal and the assets of the business are locked. So we're not able to sell off the business in, in its form we can't split it up in little bits and sell it off it has to stay in its entirety and the reason we opted for this some years ago really was to partly deal with the problem of succession and i know this is a an issue mm-hmm. in, in other countries as well you know what happens when you get old how are you going to manage this farm who's going to take over so as to make it easier for a person or a group of people more like to take the farm over at some point in the future when i eventually um expire for one for a better word um and also it made us um slightly more attractive in terms of sourcing capital grants for projects which we wanted to do we're not allowed in theory to make a huge profit um we we do make a profit and we we do of course have to make a profit but the the, the profit for the business is reinvested back in the business so it's an ongoing growth business if you like we're not um we're not putting vast amounts of money into shareholders pockets or anything like that so it's it's kind of protected it's a protected business if you like and it's been now for five or six years we've done this we're quite happy with it it works very well and it also gives us a better sort of credibility in the local community i think than being sort of um sole owners which we previously mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And there's a, there's a couple of different, you know, things in the U S that are kind of similar to that. Um, so it's interesting to hear about that one. I'll have to research it some more. So uh, Tully, tell us about your, your background before you got a farm bean, what were you doing before that? I'm actually a woodworker by trade. I, I've always been a woodworker. My father was a woodworker. He was a carpenter. Um, I was brought up in a very working class environment so i lived in the, in the city or on the edge of the city um i have no connections at all with agriculture i didn't have any family members in agriculture and i sort of fell into agriculture i suppose almost by accident i actually needed somewhere to live we were quite destitute at, at an early stage in my life i was in my early 20s about 21 i had a wife and a baby nowhere to live needed someone to live ended up on a farm and i always sort of like the idea of a farm it was sounded you know i had this picture book image that so many Mm -hmm. farms um so i kind of like the idea of the farm and i and i i really did enjoy my time there it was a great education it taught me a lot about agriculture it wasn't it turned out to be not the sort of farm i wanted to Mm -hmm. be too involved in long term but it certainly was a great um it was a great boost in my life and it opened my eyes to agriculture and then of course organic um which in those days was not much more than a word um sort of became my my passion and i took it from there so i i came into this in a fairly roundabout way but this is pretty typical of many people in organic horticulture in the uk um and great number of them are from non-farming backgrounds this is quite normal actually interesting so let's talk about the farm as it is today what is a typical and obviously you know throughout the season it changes but what does a typical week look like typical week uh okay well as you say it can change very very variously um from one end of the week to the other um we're harvesting pretty much every day of the week in fact we are harvesting every day of the week, um, excluding weekends and even then sometimes there may be some element of harvesting because we're 100% direct sales. So of our production, around 55 or 60% is going through our farm shop. Uh, the other sort of 45% is going through our bot scheme. You, I think you would call that a CSA, it's like a mm-hmm. CSA, um, which is based quite locally. Our, in, our sort of network of uh, customers is within a, most of it within a five mile radius of the farm. There's some little bit beyond there, but not much. So around around 80% of what we produce is sold within a sort of five to 10 mile radius of the farm. So we're harvesting regular, and because of the nature of the crops we have, we have a lot of uh, leafy stuff as well, mm-hmm. sort of staple crops like potatoes, onions, carrots, things which don't need harvesting so often. Um, we are pretty much every day of the week it might slow down a bit in the winter because we can harvest 
a bit more in the winter at a time because it doesn't go off because it's damp and cool. Um, but in general terms, harvesting is our, our, one of our main preoccupations. This time of year, it's pretty much all harvesting. I mean, that's pretty much all we do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm usually personally involved in things like repairing, maintaining machinery, building. We've always got a building project on somewhere on the farm and, you know, management planning and also dealing with advisory clients. And, you know, this last two months, uh, two weeks, I've had, I think I've probably done eight or 10 webinars. Suddenly webinars are the big thing. Um, yes. Farm walks, which we, we used to do a lot of until COVID. I was doing a farm walk more than one a week. Um, that's, more, more or less stopped completely because of COVID. So it's all now moving online, which is fine. It's taking a little bit of getting used to, uh, but it does occupy quite a bit of my time. So it's a diverse week. It really is. And as you know, things crop up, you know, suddenly something breaks or has to be fixed or um, there's some, some crisis somewhere in the field has to be dealt with. Um, <laughs> so, so you never know quite what to expect but my day, mm -hmm. starts, my day starts usually pretty early with with emails usually around six o'clock half past six i'm on i'm on the emails as as, as you probably are too mm -hmm. yeah well yeah it's it's important well because i have a three-year-old and a five-year-old so when they're up you know then the life just gets crazy but um but yeah up early i mean this morning actually i was up around 3 30 um yeah. and uh not by choice it's just <laughs> um but yeah i mean just, just one of those things i'm up and then i'm just i just get to work because you might as well just get started and and uh kind of work through the day um but I, I think the thing too is that the, that's the the fun thing about farming is that every single day seems to change. And uh, on one aspect, it's crazy because you're like oh, you're just like putting out fire after fire. But the other aspect is it just makes it so much fun because you get the problem solve. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the I think the reason I'm still in this after you know nearly five decades is I enjoy that element of problem solving. I enjoy that element of not being able to quite predict what's going to happen and also the element of not being actually quite 100 in control i mean we farmers are by nature generally control freaks but we have to acknowledge that there are elements that we cannot control and i think that element is 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 that in a way is, is interesting yes it can be mm -hmm. challenging as well i mean often it can be very challenging and it's usually based around the weather um, but i think that is a, an important element and if you don't thrive on that um don't farm Thing. yes you know, <laughs> if you're not if you're not able to deal with the the unknown and the unexpected um i think you need to change your career <laughs> yes yeah go get an office job or, yeah. or work for somebody else who will manage that because i think too i think that aspect of if you want to be in agriculture you can always be in agriculture if you don't want that stress just work for someone else so you're just more of the person doing the work instead of having to deal with all the challenges Oh, absolutely. There's plenty of opportunities. In fact, um, I don't know how it is for you in the US, but in UK, there is a shortage of skilled growers in the mm -hmm. country who, you know, we need to get more growers. And I mean, I know you're doing a lot of work towards this. And, you know, we, we need to get more people on the ground doing this. And, you know, it takes, you know, it's not something you learn in two weeks. It, it takes a lot of effort. And we need to be concentrated on that in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I know that every single week, it seems like someone reaches out to us saying, Hey, I'm looking for this person or that person, uh, because there is a, a shortage of people that can um, obviously just, uh, just do vegetable production. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a challenging skill to learn in some aspects. So let's talk about the stock free aspect of your farm, because that's something that's very interesting um, that you don't run your farm without any animal inputs. Yes, that's right. And this is something, again, which kind of happened by accident. I mean, most of my farm, I, I feel, probably happened by accident rather than by design. Um, yeah. It wasn't like I suddenly had a light bulb moment one day that, ah, we're going to completely exclude all livestock inputs. It was really because when we moved to this farm over 33, 34 years ago, I started looking around for manure as, as, we, as we had in the previous mm -hmm. farm. Really found it difficult to get any. We're in a part of the country which doesn't have a lot of sort of agricultural activity. It's it's semi-rural. Um, you know, we're quite close to to, um, to towns and villages. Um, there's a lot of horses around. So the only manure which seemed to be available was horse manure. So I go along to the stables. I talk to the people there, and I, I wanted to find out a what the horses were fed and b what what else they would get mm -hmm. inputs. And I was slightly hor slight horrified when I heard sort of stuff they were getting, anthromentics and antibiotics and all the rest of it. I thought, well, 
I don't really want that on my land. Yeah. Um, so I thought, well, okay, well, let's well, maybe we could perhaps do without this. And I'd heard somewhere in some distant publication that the Chinese had for thousands of years pretty much run their entire agricultural system based on green manure. So they, they had very few livestock in China because of space and land availability. It wasn't an option until relatively recently. So I kind of knew this had a possible idea that it might just work so um i sat down and kind of worked out a rotation which didn't include animal manures but did include lots of green manures and i built the rotation around that need and it's developed from there it's taken some time but this has now been in place for over 30 years we um we we actually set up the first world's first ever stock free organic standards some 15 years ago in collaboration mm. with the soil association and the vegan organic network and when i first started it wasn't specifically about excluding livestock that wasn't what it was but as i've gone through this process i've suddenly realized that a we do not need livestock manures we can manage perfectly well without it and b the issue of importing ghost acres is is something which i think growers perhaps haven't really thought about and, and the ghost acre is somebody else's land mm-hmm. so if for example i was bringing in as i would have been previously you know for sort of 17 acres of land i, I probably could have been importing you know perhaps two three hundred 400 tonnes of manure every year. And that's mm-hmm. an equivalent area of land actually greater than my farm. You know, we're looking at 20, 30 acres of land to produce that. That's somebody else's fertility. That's depriving somebody else's land of their fertility. And organic farmers in the UK are not allowed to sell off manure primarily because they're exporting fertility. So the issue around that was really about the ethical considerations of importing land and using ghost acres because most other land is also dependent you know most livestock is dependent on vast imports of food from god knows where else in the world you know some of its soil from you know rainforests in in south america and all the other mm-hmm. issues that go around it so there's an ethical issue around importing ghost acres but also there's a there's a practical issue around the difficulties of sourcing good quality manure i mean we have to compost it properly in the uk we're not allowed to use it like composting you can't apply it to certain crops at certain times a year there's a lot of con- control and restrictions about manure because of the dangers of e coli and mm-hmm. which has been a, a problem both here and, and i know also in the us so mm-hmm. there's a lot of restrictions over it and a lot of things you have to get right before you can use it so we've kind of cut most of those difficulties out by excluding livestock manures and then we decide well if we're excluding manure we may as well go the whole hog and just have nothing to do with livestock at all so we removed the small element of fish blood and bone which we had been using in in as plant raising substrates we used to use it as a fertilizer we cut that out um and then we you know we decided that the farm from that point on was going to be a stock-free farm and for want of a better word you could say this is a vegan farm you don't have to be a vegan to do this Mm-hmm. Um, you can be a you know a, a McDonald's munching uh, carnivore, but <laughs> it's a system. It's a system which is important, and it's really about utilizing. It's really about the optimization of land rather than maximization of land. So we've developed a rotation which is um, quite dependent on green manures, and also we use wood chip technology and ramule chip wood quite a bit. We're growing in total land area out of our. 17 18 acres we're, we're growing on uh two-thirds of that land at any one time so around 65 percent of our land is always in cropping and the other 30 35 percent is in green manures which are rotating around the farm moving with the rotation so we're uh-huh. not cropping 100 percent of the land and i don't think that's actually possible i don't think anybody can crop 100 percent land we're well, certainly not without bringing in a vast amount of input mm-hmm. by its size. So we're looking at a farm really in terms of being much more self-sufficient and there's nothing quite like excluding manure to focus your attention on where your fertility is going to come from mm-hmm. and making sure you don't lose what you have. And this is the key to what we do. We've been really, um, really aggressive in terms of making sure that we don't lose nutrients. So everything about the management of the soil is down to keeping nutrient in, keeping ground covered, maximum use of green manures at at many times, even within growing crops, we now use some green manures under sown Uh, and not squandering fertility. You know, all too often I've seen people bringing in vast amounts of 
importing the material from outside and, and wasting it by sort of plowing it 10 inches deep and you know, mm-hmm. applying it in the winter, letting the rain wash it all away. I mean, this happens so much. But when you don't have that, you have to be much more conscious about how you manage your soil. And we've seen some significant improvements in our land. The land we have is is not really good quality. It's pretty pretty me- well. It's less than mediocre. It's actually not considered fit for horticulture. It's um, grade three B land, which puts it in the, in the category of grassland or, or tree cover, basically. So you know we're not gifted with beautiful soil to start with. Um, we're forty percent stone over ten millimeters. So it's it's been working really well and if you can do it on this soil i think it's you know it's got possibilities of doing it on pretty much any soil type and we've mm-hmm. seen we've seen our organic matter go up not dramatically but it's been going up steadily over the last 30 years we've seen our p and k levels go up quite dramatically where we did inherit very low p and k primarily because of previous cropping where the, the field had been hay crop from from the war years right up until the time i took it on it had been hay crop annually with <clears throat> almost nothing put back so we inherited a, a very um low fertility situation and we've seen our p and k levels go up not dramatically but they've been going up steadily and they still continue to go up um, and we're looking at soil health. We have a lot of trials work going on the farm, looking at soil health. We, we're looking at the cave earthworm populations. We look at mycorrhiza um, uh, colonies. We're looking at a whole range of biological activities in the soil. And we're measuring P and K on a regular basis. And we've seen some real improvements in this, particularly so since we've been using ramiel chip wood. Ramiel chip wood has been an absolute game changer for us. Mm. So how do you manage nitrogen then? Do you, do you add some, you know, vegetable based sources of that or? No, we don't use any fertilizers at all. We haven't imported any fertilizers uh, or any organic inputs to the farm um, with the exception of some wood chip for over 30 years. Nitrogen is primarily managed through clovers, uh, okay. cover crops and um improvements to organic matter so we're you know we're, we're, we're putting organic matter back and then we're drawing it off in, in terms of cropping so for us organic matter is really important of course it is for every grower but for us we see it as a way of <clears throat> putting energy back in the soil which we then exploit at a later date so uh. you know, we're, it's a carbon exchange we take it from the atmosphere we put it back in the soil we use it for crop growing and we've never run into any problems with nitrogen deficiency apart from very occasionally in the spring i mean we we, we get pretty terrible weather sometimes in mm-hmm. the country i mean it can be really cold and wet until may some years and then if the soil is very cool then nitrogen will be slow to release and we can struggle occasionally on things like spring cabbage um overwintered spring onions things like that which are really slow to get going that's the only time i've ever looked at it thinking well we could do with a, a bit of a shot of end but we never have because in time the soil warms up and everything goes crazy and then suddenly it's going too fast you can't keep on top of it um, yes so Nitrogen is the least of our problems. And what, in terms of the nitrogen we've been looking at, in terms of what we have in the system, um, we have ample reserves. Um, of some of our long-term lays, which are down for over two years, we'll, we'll be fixing over three or 400 pounds of nitrogen per acre, which is more than you can possibly use in just about any crop. Um, yeah. Potatoes for us are probably the most demanding crop. They go at the year first point in the rotation after long-term fertility burn so we have a two-year lay uh, which is a mixture of legumes and non-legumes it will also contain wild flowers and to that we're adding ramiel chip wood or composted chip wood and then potatoes because they're a heavy feeder go in after that part of the rotation and this year we had uh, we had an exceptional year we've had in the last five or six years we've been getting really good years we had 55 ton a hectare potatoes that's around 22 ton an acre that is good and that was 91 percent saleable so only nine percent of that was grayed out i mean it i i, I can't help but boast about it but it was yeah such, it was such an exceptional yield um yeah okay we had some pretty good weather as well this year we had some really good sun in, in may and june which we don't always get that made a big difference we have irrigation but you wouldn't get that yield if you didn't have the, have the n p and k in there so you know we, we know we know the system works um and you know we can see by our yields that it's sustainable it stacks up and we don't have any any particular nutrient deficiency problems.
Yeah, no, that is a fabulous yield. Um, I, I grew potatoes for a number of years and um, we did good, but those, those, that's great, especially with the management system. Okay, so um, talk a little bit more about the Ramiel wood because you, you shared about that. Um, how are you making compost out of that? Are you spreading it on the fields during the cover crop systems? Yeah, there's two two aspects to ram your wood. So I'll deal first with composting wood chip. It's, it gets a bit confusing. So we've got two products. We've got composted wood chip and we've got ram your wood chip. Now, composted wood chip is mostly coming from um, a local tree surgeon. Okay. Um, he works in the local area. He doesn't go far. I mean, there's a lot of trees where we are. A lot of people have tree management on a regular basis. So it's mostly coming from people's domestic private gardens. He brings it to us. Um, Normally, he'd have to take it to a central site. They have to pay quite a lot of money to leave it there, whereas he comes to us, he doesn't pay anything. We get it for free, so it's a mutually beneficial arrangement. Um, It's mixed trees. It could be anything like half a dozen different species. We get quite a bit of um, conifer, which is not ideal. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to compost, so we we limit that to no more than 25% maximum. Some of it would be ornamental trees, but it could also be indigenous trees. It's chipped. It's quite finely chipped. We um we row it up, so we put it into windrows every every six or eight weeks. So I row it up with a, a mini excavator, leave it in piles so it's in long rows up to 40, 50 yards. We don't have yards, feet, um, hundred hundred foot long, yeah, um, uh, twelve foot wide at the base and and about five to six foot deep. Um, I turn it roughly every sort of. 12 to 14 weeks and the idea to turn it is to, to keep the composting process going because it will eventually cool down it gets very hot we've, we've had temperatures up to up to 80 82 degrees we've actually, wow we've actually had it hot enough to cook potatoes over a 24-hour period so it's quite interesting that we can yeah use it for cooking so the idea of turning it really is to is to sort of kick start the process again it the whole process is really dependent on and everybody's, again, the question is, well, where's the nitrogen come from? You do not need nitrogen to compost wood. What you're doing primarily is you're encouraging the, 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 the indigenous fungi and bacteria to do the process for you. So the wood that's coming in, the, the CN ratio is, is horrendous. It might be three or 400 or even 500 to one. Um, there is no nitrogen in it. Even when it's got leaves in the summer, which it does, the nitrogen content's really low. So we are dependent on, on fungi primarily for this process. And, and it gets really hot, as I said. Then it cools down after about three months, then we we turn it again and we do that maybe three or four times by which time a year has passed so it's not a quick process and then it's ready to be applied so we may be spreading that on the fields at quite modest amounts we're putting down um it's only you know it's not even half an inch thick um the actual official calculation we come up with is 70 cubic meters per hectare so it's um I don't, I'm not sure what that is in, in imperial terms. You know, we, we went metric in this country 35 years ago, but we're still dealing with the, uh, the, uh, uh, yes. uh, the, the fallout from that. Um, we're looking at, um, it's around, it's around uh, 15 tonnes per acre in, 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 your, in your money. Okay, okay, right. gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So it's a pretty small amount, and we measure it in cubic meters because it's actually much easier to measure what you put on in cubic meters or cubic feet than it is to measure it in, in tons because it varies depending on the moisture content, as you know. Yeah. So it's a, it's a pretty modest application. That's going on at, for two years in the rotation. It only goes on to green manure crop. It doesn't go on to bare soil because putting organic material on bare soil can be quite wasteful. You can lose quite a lot of value. And also, because we're putting it on to a green manure crop we have a situation where the soil is is stable it has uh-huh. been tilled for a year or two the urban population has grown rapidly we've also got the, the right fungi and bacteria because the fungi and bacteria as soon as you stop tillage all that starts to p- come back again it recovers very quickly because we're on basically min till anyway so we're not doing horrendous damage to the soil so the bacteria and the fungi do the final processing of the, of the wood chip so that's composted wood chip. We also use it for plant raising for substrate use. So we put it through a, a grader. We grade it down to 10 millimeters, uh, about three eighths of an inch. And that goes in uh, as a mix for plant raising. We add a little bit of um, vermiculite to that and that's it, nothing else added. Um, and we've done trials. We've done a lot of trials work on this over many years. We've compared it with other 
substrates, some organic, some conventional, and it performs just as well. And the, the, the beauty of it is it, it doesn't have any peat. We, we, we stopped using peat 20 years ago because we think that the use of peat is a, is a terrible thing to be happening anywhere in agriculture. It shouldn't be allowed because of the environmental destruction of, of peat areas. You know, peat contains more carbon than rainforest per given area. So we've kind of cut peat out completely and we're using wood chip as a means of raising plants. We don't do a huge number of plants. I mean, we're doing about, we do about 150,000 plants a year, but only half of those are actually raised in trays or modules. The rest are grown as, as peg plants, as a bare root plant transplanted to field. So we've, um, we've used it for plant raising very successfully. We also use it in the tunnels. Uh, we use probably more compost in tunnels than we do in the field because we're cropping uh, much heavier. We're, we're expecting you know, on average two and a half, three crops a year from tunnels because we, we do crop pretty much right from the winter. So we're putting in slightly more than we would in the field and it's, it's our main fertility input in tunnels. We don't have very much in the way of green manures and tunnels. Now then, moving on to ramule chip wood. This is something which I, I knew about probably 20 years ago, but never really got into because it was a big unknown. And my big fear was, oh, hang on a minute, we're going we're gonna to screw up our nitrogen if we start putting wood chip on the ground. Because I, I, mm -hmm. made, I made a huge mistake many years ago with strawberries. I, I dumped on a whole load of wood chip. It wasn't fresh wood chip. It was wood chip from the journey workshop. And I used it instead of straw. We couldn't get straw one year for strawing the plants. So we got wood chip and put down sort of two or three inches. It looked great, smelt nice. Uh, it was a complete and total disaster. Two things went wrong. Firstly, the strawberries tasted of pine, which is not good. Oh. Yeah, because the, the pine, it was softwood. So the pine, it's very volatile. You've got turpins and things in that wood, which come out when the sun gets warm, which is mm. got strawberries. And the other thing was when I eventually... Um, turn this crop in after the second or third year we had the most horrendous nitrogen deficiency which went on for about four years mm. of the wood chip uh -huh. consuming all nitrogen so i was quite wary about wood chip so uh, it took me 10 years to kind of pluck up courage to have a go at this and i did a bit of reading there isn't much out there about around your chip wood most of the work has been done in france there's some work being done by your neighbors in canada um, mm -hmm. in fact i'm doing a seminar there to later today on, on this very subject or partly on this subject so there's been a bit of work done but not a huge amount it is worth looking into because it has some real possibilities so what we're doing is we're using fresh chip wood which is done in the winter you have to do it when um when the leaves are off the trees you don't actually want green material with it at all you want just young wood so any any material any tree which is less than three or four inches in diameter you want young wood you don't want old wood old wood is no good it's dead and inert you want young wood so branch wood is ideal so we're we're coppicing we have a, an area of um you have coppice in the u.s i think you must do. well it's very limited there are a few places that do it but um it's actually something that we're thinking of for our property because our, we're in the middle of uh, at, uh, neighborhoods and we like to create a barrier around our property and so it'd be great to have the young kept young and short trees for that so that's we're actually really looking into that on our back hedgerow right well you're going to love this because this is going to work for you so well it really is so we planted an area of coppice uh, coppice used to be very common in uk but it went mm -hmm. out of, uh, fashion because of the way agriculture changed but we planted uh, just over half an acre a corner of our field which is habitually wet i mean we went there with two tractors stuck there one day in the <laughs> summer uh, years ago so i sort of gave up on it thought hang on let's let's, let's plant some trees there so we planted some willow and yeah. the protection in those days actually was willow for firewood because white willow is quite a good firewood and we, we have wood burners so we want our own firewood so i planned it primarily for firewood 120 trees and and then about eight or nine years ago we started looking into this round your chip wood thing and thought well we've got some of our own here maybe we'll give it a go and we managed to, to get a, a trials um set up in fact it was five years ago um with the organic research center they helped me establish a trial they found the funding and the money they found the researchers to do the the work um, all i had to do was do the chip and spread it so we set up a project and what we were doing we were comparing ramule chip wood with composted chip wood and nothing to see what the differences were so we're applying this again in the same way that we use composted chip wood we're, we're applying it only to green manure crops onto a green manure crop leaving on the surface and then letting nature take over 
And again, the amounts we apply are quite modest. It's, it's about sort of 12, 15 tonnes an acre, um, 50 to 70 cubic metres per hectare for us. So it's going on at about sort of, you know, it's less than three eighths of an inch thick. It's rather like sugar on a cake. It's not a large mm -hmm. amount. It sort of covers the ground just about, but you can see stuff growing through it in the, even in the winter. So we've, we've done this now for four years, looking at the differences between composted wood chip and ramia wood chip. And the differences are, are very, very slight. The, the big difference is we don't have to compost it. So it's straight from the hedge or straight from the mm -hmm. coppice, straight on the field. And we do it in the same day. So I have a couple of guys in with chainsaws and a chipper. We, we chip it all up and we do sort of, you know, 100 cubic meters in a day, put it straight in the manure spreader onto the field, job done. Um, the results have been really interesting. I mean, we have seen some staggering earthworm populations. I mean, we're now up to more than uh, what's 10 million per hectare, so about three and a half, four thousand per acre. At three, three hundred, no, three and a half to four million per acre. It's a staggering. Wow. Number. And also big increases in fungi and, and bacteria, mycorrhiza, uh, P and K levels have suddenly gone up. But it's also similar on the wood chip section as well. The difference is we haven't had to compost it. So we're actually using half the amount to get the same result. Whereas the composting process of, of wood chip is, is obviously, you know, we create a lot of heat. So we're wasting something somewhere. We're wasting a lot of energy yeah. and heat. So, we're, you know, we're using out some of the goodness of the wood chip um, to create heat, which is a bit counterproductive. It works okay for us because it means we can mix different materials together and we can mix some material which is not so good for composting with some which is better. But the ideal situation definitely is round mill chip wood. And the one which really proved itself above all other species when we did several species was willow. Willow is an absolute game changer, partly because it's really fast to grow. It's a great establisher within, you know, seven or eight years, you know, you've got a huge amount of, of, of carbon um, growing up. And also it's very easy to process. It's easy to cut. Um, it grows nice and straight. So you get nice regular poles. It could be, very well mechanized actually uh, we compared it with other woods hazel and maple and one or two other things but willow was was by far the best so what we're looking at in within this trial is how much of our well the ultimate role again i suppose you know, the ultimate aim i suppose with the trial is to see how much of our farm we would have to put back into trees let's say put back because this land was in trees a thousand years ago yeah back into trees in order to have all of our carbon needs because you know if you're growing food you're exporting carbon of course you need to replace that grimmures do a pretty good job of of not losing carbon but you don't actually gain very much you need you still need to be putting something back i mean the gains of green manure and carbon are very slow whereas the gains the gains of carbon through using wood chip or ramiel chip wood uh, are much higher. You know, you gain a, a much better carbon return on that. So the idea was, how much of our farm do we need to grow trees on? And we've already got quite a lot. We've got, we've got within our 17 acres, we've got nearly two miles of hedges, which have been there some of them for a thousand years. But mm. one one hedge which I planted when I first came here 30 odd years ago is the most productive because we put in species that were faster grown than the traditional old hedges that have been here for decades or generations of fact um, and we're using hedges uh, as a as a as a as a, a resource for ram or chip wood and we're using the willow so we've already got quite a bit of woodland on the farm already um, and we're growing investments within that we, we come up with a figure of probably around 20 percent of our land would have to be in trees in order to supply more than the, the carbon requirement we need and we can push yields much higher than, than we have now if we had more carbon. It's as simple as that. And we can also sequester carbon, which is good for the, you know, the, the planet as well. So we're kind of moving towards more trees, and we've started to integrate trees. Well, we've always planted trees, but we've done it more in the last five or six years. We've done one of our fields, which is quite small. It's only seven, just under seven acres. We planted in agroforestry system so we have rows of trees every 23 meters so roughly every 80 foot apart and we're growing vegetables between those rows um, and we're doing that primarily because we're looking at long-term wood chip in ramiel chip wood but also in terms of increasing the biodiversity of the farm even even further than we already have
Very cool. That is fascinating. I can't wait to start experimenting with that here. All right, so let's move a little bit more into the carbon footprint too, because that's another key aspect that you talk about too, is just how little of carbon footprint your farm is. Yeah, we've done a couple of carbon footprint studies, and I think it's something which you wouldn't want to do every year because it's actually quite a bit of work. I mean, this is several days or probably almost a week trawling through records in the office and looking at invoices and doing calculations but it's a really useful exercise in terms of looking at where your carbon is going in terms of what you spend in terms of fuel and uh -huh. machinery buildings everything packaging we looked at the whole spectrum of carbon use <clears throat> and then comparing it to you know what we potentially are putting back into the farm and um, it's quite interesting the figures you come up with because it, it really focuses your focuses your attention on where your system is perhaps not very very robust and where you have room for big improvement and you know we, we saw some really interesting figures coming out when we first did it which was in 2012 now 2012 um, if you speak to anybody in the UK about 2012 if you've been in grow and they kind of roll their eyes and say oh yeah I remember 2012 but it was the worst season we've ever had it rained <clears throat> non-stop from may through till the end of august when i say non-stop i mean it just almost never stopped and we have flooding and it yeah terrible. it was really bad you know so we did it that year which is perhaps not the best year to do it but what we what we discovered that year was that we in terms of the carbon we were putting back so we're looking at carbon that goes back so carbon sequestration in terms of increases in soil organic matter which a very very tiny percentage increase in organic matter in the soil makes a it's a big carbon input. It really is. Looking at hedgerows, because we have a lot of hedgerows, so you get so much per meter of hedgerow. Um, looking at trees, where we planted trees. Looking at green manures, because they also sequester some carbon, but there's also losses with green manure. You can create nitrous oxide, which is quite damaging to um, carbon. And then looking at um, uh, crop residues and looking at the whole carbon input picture and then comparing the two. So what we came up with in, in that year was we actually had a carbon positive. So we actually put slightly more back than we'd used. And that was really encouraging. I thought, this is great. But that year was not a typical year. We had low yields. Um, <clears throat> we didn't get, we didn't, we didn't have uh, huge crops to sell that year. We, some crops fell completely. Um, we didn't make any money. In fact, we made a loss. We didn't buy anything. So if you don't buy anything, uh -huh, uh -huh. you're not spending carbon. We didn't invest in the business. We didn't do any building. You know, a whole lot of things we didn't do, which would have been carbon if we had. So it wasn't a typical year. We've done it again. We did it um, about five years later, and uh, that was quite a different picture. We had a, a much better season. Um, the carbon sequestration uh, wasn't quite. In fact, it was quite a bit less than what we'd actually spent. So it was a reversal. So we'd actually used more carbon in the recent um, calculation we, we had in the first one, and we put far less back into the soil. And the reason for that was because we'd had a couple of good years, we were spending money, we were putting up buildings, we bought, we bought some new machinery. Mm -hmm. As soon as you buy new machinery, that screws up your carbon credits for a long time because it's a 10 year write-off period. So if I was to go, I haven't quite, but if I was to go and buy a brand new tractor tomorrow, which would cost me about 30 grand, uh -huh. um, that would set back my, my, any positive carbon footprint for 10 years. You know, we could gain it back slowly, but over 10 years, that piece of machinery gets written off. It depends how you, I mean, you, you plan, you, when, you, when you look at your carbon study, there are different ways of doing it, but we're keeping to a specific program, which was designed by farmers for farmers. There's, there's a lot of, um, slightly dodgy figures out there on carbon footprinting as you can imagine and it's still uh -huh. a relatively new science but it, what it does and although i don't think the figures are 100 accurate it really does focus your attention on where your carbon losses are on the farm and where you could be putting a lot more back you know with um the tool that we're using you can input interesting things like you know i put in um just out of interest because we have sort of four or five acres of green manure at any one time i thought well what about if we put some sheep on there? How would that change our carbon footprint? Thinking it might be mm. slightly better. It completely, it lost a huge amount of carbon, you know, far more than I'd ever imagined. So that was, you know, an interesting exercise that, you know, we kind of felt was worth, worth running through. And 
it's interesting different scenarios you can input and see how it impacts on your business and this carbon footprinting it, it doesn't dominate my life but certainly a lot of the decisions on the farm tend to be geared towards you know how we're going to improve our, our carbon footprint you know can we reduce our energy can we reduce our diesel usage can we reduce how many new machines we buy in all these factors you know i mean we you know, we could do all that if we took more labor on, but as you know, you can't take more labor on because it costs too much, you know? Yeah. You know, we could, we could completely annihilate our carbon footprint just by employing 200 people, um, but we can't pay 200 people. Yeah. And, and as I'm sure you've discovered over the years, you know, we make decisions on the farm, many of which are based on economic considerations and it may not be they may not be the ideal considerations for the climate change or for carbon sequestration but it's what we have to do because we're in that system mm -hmm. sort of system yeah i mean we're in this constraint um of so many other people not caring about at all and so we can only care so much because other because of the costs associated with that which is it's a very interesting paradigm, but I, you know, it's again, it's one of those things you do the best you can. And, you know, as long as at the end of the day, you still can make a bit a income because obviously financial stability is the first tenant of a successful farm. You've got to make a profit so the farmer Absolutely. can keep farming. Mm -hmm. Then the next goal is obviously, as you said, how small can we get this carbon footprint? With that, I'd like to take a stop here and take a quick break in a minute. We'll be back with, Tully to talk all about the rest of his farming enterprise. Joining me for another marketing tip is Cole Jones from Local Line. Cole, talk to us about customer credits. What does that look like? Hey, Michael, thanks for having me back. Yeah, we do. We do have some interesting, uh, an interesting tip to share today around customer credits. Customer credits uh, is exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's basically offering uh, an upfront purchase for the customer, which gives them a bulk amount of credit. Say they pre-buy $100 uh, from your farm. And then as they make orders, they're able to sort of eat into that credit or basically buy down that credit over uh -huh. time. We launched, as, as in Localine, our team launched a customer credits feature for CSAs a few months ago. And we've been really amazed at how non-CSA uh, businesses are able to use the feature as well as an innovative way to improve their cash flow. So what they've been able to do is even if they don't necessarily have a box program with a delivery program sort of set up each week, they're able to go to their more loyal customers and say, hey, we have these almost pre-purchase packages. And so if you pre-purchase you know, this customer credit, maybe $500 credit, they get some small, the customer gets a small upfront discount for doing so, but the farm gets all of that bulk capital upfront before they've had to deliver any product at all. And so we think that this is a really uh, wonderful way to think about improving cash flow and financing for the farm, even if you're not a CSA business, because mm -hmm. it gives you an opportunity to get the cash upfront uh, and then be able to offer that customer basically the, the ability to eat down that credit over the course of the season. And it involves the customer much further earlier in the growing season with you. So they get more involved earlier. And I think they feel like more, they're supporting you more. Well, I think this is part of the benefit, right? I think probably like a secondary benefit outside of the upfront capital is this increased closeness to mm. the customer where they feel part of the community part of your story and it, it increases the lock-in for them, right? There's, there's more emotional attachment to the product and to the success of the farm. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. We are back with Tully and we are talking about uh, a lot of things. We've just kind of wrapped up the carbon studies that you've been doing. Now I want to talk about a little bit of the marketing you do. Um, you do the box share and then you also do the on-farm store. How did you develop the store? Well, the store happened uh, like most things on this farm in a sort of a, for want of a better word, an organic way. We About... 10 years ago, our box scheme numbers started dropping, and this happened mm. right across the whole country, um, primarily because of the financial crash, and then also supermarkets suddenly started getting on organic base in a big way. There was a lot more choice for consumers. Until then, we'd had a very big box scheme. We were doing over 450 a week, and gradually started to 
slow down and, and numbers drop. So we had to find an alternative outlet. So we set up a little store, sort of farm gate store, just on a barrow, really, with a shade over the top. Um, and just sort of put a few things there. It was really slow. I mean, we, you know, if we took 20 quid in a day, we thought we were doing all right, you know. I mean, mm. Yeah. Um, it was quite pathetic, actually, looking back on it. But it did it did sort of get people interested and gradually it grew. And after a couple of years, we, we made a bigger barrow and a bit more shade cover and put more veg there. And gradually it started to pick up honesty box. We, we've never manned it, honesty box. And then three years ago, um, well, by this time, we've kind of grown to a temporary building. So we had a, a straw bale building with a OSB and tarpaulin roof and a couple of holes for windows. And, and that worked really well. The straw bales lasted for six years and, and um, didn't fall apart. Eventually, we composted it. And, you know, each year it got a little bit busier and more and more people got to know about it. And suddenly we realized it actually had potential. So we thought, okay, well, let's build a proper building. Let's put up a really nice building. So we raised some money. We did a, a crowdfunder. We raised seven and a half grand. Um, I did the building. I, I do all the building. I, I love building. Um, used all local materials, recycled timber. We even cut some trees down from a neighbor's yard and, and planked it up and did stuff with that. Uh, it's off grid. So we have solar power for lights. And it's quite well situated. We're on a, we're on a very small road, but it's a, you know, it's a road where quite a few people do mm -hmm. as well. We're also very close. We're in fact we're adjacent to a public cycleway and several public footpaths, and particularly the last few months have been really busy. So it was in the right position, right in the corner of the field where people could see stuff growing. So it kind of looks nice. Mm. And our sales have gone from strength to strength. I mean, when we opened the shop up two years ago, we were turning over about sort of five hundred pound a week and we're now up to more than three thousand a week uh, and it continues to grow so it's become more than half our business or but it is yes it is slightly more than half our business now it's, we still run it as a honesty box uh, a lot of people now pay direct to the bank through backs um, but we still get a lot of cash which as you know is quite handy it's quite nice to have cash mm -hmm. um, and it works really well it's open 24 7 we never close we have lights at night because even now we get people turning up at 10 o'clock at night shopping. Um, wow. Yeah. And people like it, I think, because it is an honesty box. So we've never had any obvious problems with, with theft. I mean, we might lose the odd bit, but then sometimes we also gain. Sometimes people put more money in mm -hmm. too. And, and, you know, people kind of work out for themselves. So we trust people 100%. Sometimes they put more in than they need to, and other times they put less in, but it kind of works out overall. Yeah. But, been really successful it's been it's become a, a focal point in the community so last year we put some tables and chairs seating outside and that was a, a real good move because with covid suddenly everybody wants to come out the countryside yeah so weekends we're really busy we have a lot of people around um we've done a few pop-up cafes just selling our own uh, cakes and things that we make for our own produce uh, and that's been working really well too but we've had to curtail that because of covid at the moment but um yes it's been it's been fantastic the bot scheme continues to operate and numbers have picked up since covid we're, we're, we're sort of increasing all the time um, and at the moment our sales are the best they've ever been in our 44 year history i mean we've had to turn customers away we've had to drop we were doing some small sort of scale wholesaling to other mm -hmm. area and also we were doing two farmers markets every month we've stopped all that we don't need to do them any any longer so it's been a it's been a real game changer not just the fact that we're selling direct from the farm but the situation with people suddenly being more aware of, of food months maybe that is one benefit of this is just that it really helps people slow down a little bit and think more about you know where their food comes from and that that whole journey Absolutely. I mean, people have now got time to go home, cook them in and sit down with their family, which they didn't do before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your team, talk to us about your team, because you employ a fair number of people there as well. Yeah, we've got we've got a great team. I mean, we've got five or six full time people. Most of us live on the farm, so I've created places for people to live. I think this is quite important. Um, I think if you're involved in farming, you need to be quite close. And also, it, you know, we're not paying top wages. We, we are paying well, a bit more than, than, than minimum, but not hugely more. Um, there isn't a lot of money for people to be traveling long distances to work and, and mm. time involved. So we've encouraged people to be part of the farm. We are part of a, a rural community, which is, is quite vibrant. So it's a, it's a nice place to live. Um, 
we 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 have people we have one guy who's been here for 20 22 years and and others who've been here for two or three years we get joined by new people some who come for six months and leave again uh, we have a couple of trainees in the summer they come for 12 week periods we have a, a, a training program for them and they sort of they muck in and they do a more or less a full week the same as everybody else but the team uh, as you know you know the team is the most important part of the farm and everyone's got their own roles and everyone has their own area of responsibility everybody has you know does what they like to do we, we try to get people to take on the jobs they enjoy because they do mm. better uh, we don't have you know we're not using people for weeding machines we don't do vast amounts of hand weeding I mean, we've got systems which really uh, work quite well we don't do you know we don't spend weeks on end putting weeds like carrots for example you know um, so people are able to develop their roles in, in other ways and it, it does work very well given that we are incredibly diverse no one ends up doing the same job for more than a few hours at a time and I think this is quite important as well mm-hmm. um, so yeah the team is great we, we sit down every day at 10 o'clock for half an hour well sometimes three quarters of an hour we have coffee tea biscuits talk rubbish talk gossip talk about vegetables whatever needs to be dealt with and it's a good time you know if we do need to discuss farm policy or anything we we do that uh we we, we're trying to get better at involving staff in the running of the business that's something which i think we did lack in in previous years i think we've got better at doing it primarily because the, the farm is operating better both in terms of agronomically but also in terms of economically so there's a bit more there's a bit more slack now in order to uh-huh. um, develop, allowing people to develop their own individual interests on the farm uh-huh. and i think that's an incredible place to get to because when you get to the point where you actually can enjoy each other enjoy working together as a team instead of everyone running around and just you know like their chicken with their head cut off make trying to get six things done at once it just makes the farming more enjoyable. It actually means you are actually farming much better because you're actually able to talk about what went wrong or, or challenges and actually come up with a good plan of, uh, of attack. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So let's talk about beginning farmers because you've been farming for a long time and you've probably seen a lot of farmers come and go. What would you say is the biggest mistake that you see beginning farmers make? Yes, it's it's a sad situation that, as you say, so many have come and gone, and and you know some really good people have gone as well. Which, mm. um, it is a difficult industry to, to to get into and and to maintain. I think one of the biggest mistakes is rapid expansion. I've seen this mm. you know, wrong so many times. You know, people they get a taste of success after three or four years, and they're doing an acre or two, and I think, well, if we times it by ten, we'll get ten times more money. Well, it doesn't. Mm. Work doesn't work that way as you know and yes they often you know over invest um they spend too much money they, they even borrow money which is, is, is really crazy um and i think rapid expansion is a recipe for disaster mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's the one that's the one thing. the other thing i think people do too much and it's easy for me to say this now after my experience but is, is trying to take on too much you know the, the pressure to do everything is enormous you know you get up in the morning and think well what am i going to do first you know because you have to prioritize and there's a thousand jobs crying out for you you know anytime between april and september you know there's this yeah kind of nagging fear all the time that you have to be you know really <laughs> tackling everything possible and Making those priorities are, are difficult. I mean, uh-huh. Decisions about what is the number one job today is, is a difficult one to make. And not being able to, to delegate because, you know, once you start employing people, the productivity drops per person. You know, you cannot expect people to do anything like the amount of work you did when you were on your own. I, when I started, it's just myself and, and Lynn, and we did everything, you know. And then when we started taking people out, it was like, well, they only do – they only do a fraction of what we do. We're having to pay these guys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and suddenly you realize that the more people you put on the job, the less they actually do per person. So that's another thing you have to be wary of. You know, 10 people doesn't mean they get a job done 10 times quicker. It actually means yeah. you get a job done five times quicker, not 10 times quicker. So, you know, there's a lot of potential pitfalls. Um, but I think over expansion um, is probably number one, and trying to do too much is number two. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doing too many crops. So, you know, doing too many acres and then in those acres trying to do too many crops or, you know, too much value adding or selling to 16 different places. 
Absolutely. And in trying to, you know, get a few chickens, a few ducks, cut the pigs, the cow, and all that stuff, which is a massive drain on your energy and your time. It really is. I mean, if you're going to grow vegetables, I would say to everybody, don't get animals. You know, mm-hmm. I've, been there. I've done that. I've had them. I've had yes. Animals. I've had to run around chasing things in the middle of the night. You know, you just don't need that distraction because vegetables are enough on their own without. Yeah. Them. And don't mix perennial crops with, with annual crops. I mean, I, I do do it. Um, we've got strawberries. In most cases, doing something like strawberries alongside vegetables is really hard because you have a real conflict of labor interest at a time of year when you are flat out. Okay. Okay. So let's break that down a little bit because I think people need to understand that because strawberries are a huge labor in say, let's say May and June when you're harvesting them. But on a vegetable farm, you also got to be planting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a conflict of interest because the strawberries won't wait. You know, they won't wait two hours, let alone two days. You have to be out there. And um, I mean, this year we, we picked 2,000 kilos. That's over two tons. Mm-hmm. It, took, uh, it took four people to do that, starting at 6 o'clock in the morning and working through to, to midday. And we were lucky enough we did find people. But, you know, we were in a difficult situation because COVID meant we, we couldn't get um, anybody to work because yeah. we'd had a person the previous year from, um, from overseas who been fantastic done a really good job and they kind of ran the team but we didn't have that person this year so we were in a potentially difficult situation but we did manage to pull it off by using local labor because everybody was off work yeah uh, which, which has never happened before you know everybody was at home so we yeah but um but normally that wouldn't happen and you know running parallel cropping with perennial fruit particularly strawberries and vegetables is really difficult because of the the, the, the clash of labor yeah, absolutely. What encouragement would you go back and give your new farmer 40 years ago? Um, yeah, encouragement. I think, well, encouragement comes from a, a variety of sources. I mean, having a really good market is a great encouragement. And that, I think for a lot of people, this is still one of the most difficult areas of, of development is the market. So mm-hmm. It's difficult to, to develop a market if you haven't got the produce. It's kind of chicken and egg. You need the produce to get the market, but you need the market to get the produce, you know. Um, yeah. I think, you know, being tied to, being linked into a really secure market is is a great sort of morale booster, it really is. And if I was to give direct encouragement to, to anybody, it would be, you know, look at your market, develop your markets. I think that's the one area because it's the one thing which I think a lot of growers are really just not that good on. Not mm-hmm. certainly in the UK, not so good. Maybe it's different elsewhere, but I think the market is still the, the difficult area for a lot of people. People. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farm tool? Yeah, my eyes. Okay. Because using my eyes. And uh, I put this question to people when I do seminars to say, what is your, what, what is your most favorite and most useful tool on the farm? And, and, and almost nobody gets it. Uh, and it's yeah. Eyes. Because with your eyes, you have the powers of observation. So, you know, it's not the tractor or the power harrow or, 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 or the cedar. It's the eyes because <clears throat> by observation, you know, you need to be observing a lot. You need to be out in your farm. I, I try to be looking through all my crops at least two or three times a week in the, particularly in the growing season because that power of observation can lead you to all sorts of interesting things you can see when something's not doing so well and then you have to ask why is it not doing well so you need to look you know what's going on here what's gone wrong here looking at your soil looking at your soil is one of the most it has to be the number one thing to observe is your soil so looking at your soil what you can see, what you can smell, what you can feel, and even what you can hear, because sometimes you can hear soil. So, you know, you need to really use this power of observation. I think it's the best tool you'll ever have. It's it's there, it's accessible, it works, um, doesn't cost anything. You just need to connect your eyes with with the brain, obviously, Mm. and try and make, make, make it all happen. Yes. Positive way for you. Uh, Other than eyes, um, I I guess, um, in terms of actual tool machinery type objects, I suppose a really good cedar is probably the thing I would go for first. In fact, I did. It was the first thing I really invested heavily in when I started out was a decent cedar. Mm. And what brand do you prefer? Well, we've gone through several. We've just recently bought um, a Pteridonis, which is the same as a, a Jang, but a bit Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, no difference in, in machine, it's cheaper. Um, we've used a Stan Hay. We use a Stan Hay in the field. We're doing much larger areas. The Stan Hay is a belt. It's a UK yes. belt. It's a belt drill, very effective, really good, but it does need graded seed for, for most operations. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for a smaller scale, the, 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 the Jang or the Pterodonis is, is ideal. It's, you know, in terms of technology, you know, we didn't have that sort of technology 40 years ago. Yeah. This has come on uh, uh, a lot. I mean, and it's not, I know people complain about the price, but actually it's nothing. Compared. It's cheap. Yeah. It's cheap. You know, I mean, it, if it saves you just hand thinning a couple of hundred foot rows, you've got your money back straight away. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting this year. I didn't, um, you know, we were starting the farm up new this year at this place and um, I didn't have my Jang on site and we have some challenges with the, the, uh, the COVID and all that. So I was using an earthway seeder and which I've used for a number of years and I've gotten quite good at, but the carrot seed this year, especially the Bolero seed that came from Johnny's, it was triple the size of normal carrot seed. It was massive. And I actually had a, even a hard time getting enough seed down using the radish plate, um, which is, which was fascinating. But if I'd had the Jang, I would have just have upgraded, you know, right to the a different seed size and changed that and been able to get right out and, and have the perfect stand that I wanted. Yeah. That is the beauty of having the right technology. I mean, as you, as you say, the earthway is, is you kind of, you have to learn how to use it and you, mm -hmm. get, you will get good after five years, but it's never quite the same. Yes. Yeah. Our soil, it wouldn't work. It just bounced around too much. We've got lots of stones. Yes. Yeah. Thankfully, this new farm is uh, just a real beautiful sandy loam. So it's almost, it's perfect soil. It's absolutely perfect soil. Couldn't ask for anything better. Well, um, it, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Is there, is there anything that I missed that I should have asked you? I, I will probably think of something when we, uh, when we sign out, but <laughs> think of anything at the moment. I think we've covered quite a lot. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, there's. I think I could obviously have you on for another couple episodes because there's so many questions I know I could ask you. Um, but um, you know, where can people find out more about you and your work? If they go to our website, which is tollhurstorganic.co.uk, there's quite a bit there on our website. Um, a search on, on my name or Tollhurst Organic will, will reveal lots of things. Um, there's lots of publications that I've been involved in, and, and we just had a report done on our trials into the ramule chipwood and the composted chipwood, mm -hmm. which is really interesting that's available from the organic research center orc organic research center in in uk um you can get that online it's a really interesting publication for anyone's interested in ramule chipwood and composted yeah i saw that that is linked to your website as well so people can find that there as well yes i think so we're trying to get the website a bit better in terms of trying to cover some more of the research and mm. trials work we've done in the past and some of this work goes back 40 years and it's, it's on bits of paper which makes it slightly difficult to access but yeah we mm -hmm. do more of that because there has been a lot of trials work done over a long period of time well Tully thank you so much again for your time today really appreciate you coming on good thank you very much and uh, maybe we can do it again one day Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, good luck with your new farm. I, uh, I can't, in a way, I kind of envy you having a new farm because if I had a new farm, I could sort of introduce all the technology that I've spent the last 44 years <laughs> learning. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's one of those things where I've got so many ideas because again, in the last five years, I haven't been full-time farming. I've been learning with farmers and training farmers. And so I've got so many things I want to implement but it's literally because I'm running two full-time businesses with the farm. It's, 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 it's been a just challenge to, you know, spend the time doing what I want to do on the farm. So we've got to figure out a, a better way to get me uh, less time in the businesses and more time outside. Yeah. It's a difficult getting that balance. I mean, I'm quite conscious. I I'm never more happy than when I'm wandering around the fields on the tractor or doing something by hand, you know, I, mm -hmm. mean, I do the other stuff out of, out of for sort of loyalty to, 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 to try and to improve other people's farms as, as you do as well. But you know, my own farm is still the one I love the best. It really is. Mm -hmm. And don't forget to plant trees, lots and lots of trees, agroforestry mm -hmm. and ram your chip wood is going to be the key to the future. of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we've got around uh, 900 feet of edge. And so we're planting the entire edge with a buffer of zone. And then actually we're breaking up all the field blocks with some perennial strips, which will have, you know, some smaller um, perennial plants in them, like a rhubarb and uh, some berries, some seasonal berries. Um, and then things like uh, 
willows, you know, ornamental willows and hydrangea and stuff like that too. So that's going to be fun. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, a farm needs to be beautiful and functional and you can have both. You really uh-huh. can. I mean, you know, with biodiversity, you can create such beauty on a farm, you really can. And it can be really productive having that biodiversity. So the key word is biodiversity in trees. Uh-huh. Absolutely. All right. Have a great rest yeah, of your day. Thank you. thank you very much. Goodbye. Yeah, bye. Looking to start or grow your farm business? You need a compelling farm plan that you can share with investors, convince your significant other with, or just to give yourself peace of mind. We have created a new program called the Start Your Farm Intensive. In it, you'll learn how to develop your farm idea to make sure you take all the factors into consideration for your context and your climate. You'll learn how to craft a one-page business plan that helps clearly define your target customer and lay out the necessary characteristics of your business. You will understand the three financial documents that every farm needs to fill out to make sure you are making money. And we'll give you all that as templates too. So you have the templates to fill out for your farm business. We'll also go through funding. So where to go for funding for the various stages and parts of your business. Starting a farm is hard. Starting a farm without a proven plan is almost impossible. Join us today. Go to growingfarmers.com forward slash start for more information. Now, what did past students have to say? Corey says, the exercises and spreadsheets helped me make the learning process easier and more real. Jenna says, I gained the support system and resources I needed for when I'm ready for the next step. And finally, the worksheets make you think out every aspect of the business step by step. Go ahead, join us today, growingfarmers.com forward slash start. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael here. So next week on the podcast is Matthew Hayes. Now, Matthew is a farmer in Hungary, and he farms a small market garden with also some sheep and a horse that they use for different tasks on the farm. So we talk all about permaculture and how they set up their business and the struggles they've had along the way. Matthew has farmed all over in Europe, and so he shares a little bit of his journey there. And uh, we talk all things farming and how to make it profitable. So again, go ahead, tune in next week. Can't wait to share that conversation with you. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.